In this presentation, we will be addressing one of the most fundamental concepts underlying radio astronomy. Signals measured by radio telescopes and similar instruments are basically functions of time. That is, discrete values measured at certain intervals over a period of time. The Fourier transform is a reversible, linear operation with many important properties and forms the cornerstone behind many space science observations. It provides both information about astronomy signal as well as simplified mathematical solution to complex data processing problems. We will start off by recapping some basic radio astronomy signal processing. The first three slides will visualize some basic radio signals as well as interferometry concepts, the pattern of which are Fourier functions, and you will see them again when we delve into the details of the Fourier transform. Meerkat's parabolic dish antennas collect and focus planar waves from celestial radio sources. As these plane waves from the radio source hits the circular aperture of an antenna, a diffraction pattern is formed. This is because different parts of the wave travel to the observer by different path lengths, resulting in phase differences which provide us with a diffraction pattern which we call the antenna response. Technically, Data captured by a radio telescope antenna is thus the convolution of our target observed and the antenna beam shape, which smooths or blurs our observed target. The smaller the aperture, the larger the spot size of at a given distance, and the greater the, the divergence of the diffracted beam, which sets the angular resolution. Angular resolution, in turn, describes the ability of the radio telescope to distinguish small details of an object and is limited by the diffractional interference fringes. Resolution is a function of baseline, which is basically the spacing between the fringes. Since the spatial resolution is inversely proportional to the maximum baseline length, this leads us to the slightly surprising result that a wide beam may be focused to a smaller spot size than a narrow beam and therefore a higher resolution. Radio telescopes do not measure signal strength directly. Rather, they measure antenna response patterns, which is the Fourier transform of the dish aperture illumination. Receivers and digital signal processing of the telescope front end uses the shift and modulation Fourier rules to mix high frequency signals down to lower frequencies, where they are easier to measure and to phase up the signals to ensure time-synced observations. This can be done because the delay in time domain is equivalent to a phase offset in frequency domain, which can be measured and removed during correlation. Correlation, in turn, combines the data from different antennas and is essentially a convolution of diffraction and interference patterns. And once the data is recorded, a radio image can be produced Aperture synthesis, or synthesis imaging, is a type of interferometry that mixes signals from an array of antennas to produce UV maps, having the same angular resolution as an instrument the size of the maximum baseline, as we mentioned. By measuring all separations and orientations, the response pattern of the interferometer produces an output, which are individual components of the Fourier transform of the spatial distribution of the brightness of the observed object, which we call the UV map. An image of the source is produced from these measurements by taking the inverse Fourier of this UV map. We call that deconvolution. So how do we extract a signal from a bunch of Fourier component measurements? Well, similar to a musical chord made up of a number of notes, signals are composed of a number of frequencies and the Fourier transform provides a method to decompose these signals into their respective frequencies. Consequently, the terminology of time domain signals and frequency domain spectrum. Let us consider a simple unit square wave to illustrate how a signal can be constructed using a series of sinusoidal signals with appropriate period and amplitude. Applying the concept of summing sinusoidal signals on the left, we can visualize how a square wave can be constructed by a sum of representative periodic signals on the right. 
But when comparing the resulting square wave with the theoretical signal in the previous slide, we see that the construction of the signal using a number of independent cyclic functions can never perfectly reproduce the original signal. It can only approximate it to a desired degree of accuracy depending on the number of sinusoidal functions that we added. This is a limitation of working in the discrete time domain, but with proper engineering, very close approximations are achieved. For those interested, the example shown is available in the workshop's cookbook. Feel free to play and run with component generation yourself. Getting into the mathematical meat of the Fourier transform, just as we can construct signals using simple sinusoidal functions, we can also use the concept in reverse. The inverse is that we can fit a series of sinusoidal signals to any periodic signal and from that set of functions approximate the signal as a series of sine and cosine functions with relevant frequencies and amplitude. Therefore, the commonality between the time domain representation and the frequency domain spectrum of our square wave signal example. In the time domain, all the sinusoidal co components are summed together to produce the resulting square wave signal, while in the frequency domain, the components exist separately as amplitude and phase of the individual sinusoids. The information, although presented differently, is still the same. Theoretically, the Fourier transform transforms continuous signals of infinite duration into a continuous spectrum composed of infinite number of sine waves. But the signals we process on our computers are not infinite. They are discrete signals that represent the continuous signal at specified values sampled at discrete time points and of finite duration. The Fourier transform of these sampled signals are computed using the discrete Fourier transform. The discrete Fourier transform can determine the series of sinusoids which, when summed together, reproduce the data points of the original discrete time domain signal as the equation shown above. We note that the DFT of an endpoint input time series is an endpoint frequency spectrum with the Fourier frequencies ranging from minus n over 2 through the DC or zero frequency component up to the highest frequ uh, Fourier frequency of n over 2, with each of the bin numbers representing the integer number of sinusoidal periods presented in the time series. Thus, Fourier analysis provides a method to represent a signal as a series of simple technometric functions, thereby describing the information contained in the, sing in the signal as a mathematical equation. Here just note that we use the exponential notation as a compact way to represent the cosine and sine functions. To see this in action, Let's work our way through the Fourier transform notebook, where we create a test signal of two frequencies and then recover those frequencies by applying the Fourier to the simulated signal. So let's see the Fourier transform in action. And to do that, we are going to build a simulated signal with some periods and amplitudes that we know. So we're just going to construct two cosine signals and pay attention to the frequencies, amplitude and frequencies. When we plot this as um, a single signal, we see two beats on a time domain signal. Now, if we apply the DFT or the discrete Fourier transform, what we will expect is that given that time series input, we should be able to extract out the frequency of the cosines that we put in. Now, here we simply computed or calculated the DFT equation and note we go from frequencies minus n over 2 through 0 to n over 2 and the results are like this. So we have a real and imaginary component because we have a complex signal. On the real part we see four spikes around DC. On the imaginary part we see it's e to the minus 12. The imaginary part for all intents and purposes, is so small it doesn't exist. And that is to be expected because we used a real input signal. So let's focus on two of these spikes. If we zoom in on the positive side, we see that the one spike 
is at 0.01, which is one of our input frequencies, and the other one is at the second input frequency. So through the DFT, we have now, from the time series, successfully showed that we can, that we can regain the frequencies. The one thing that we should note is that the amplitudes are slightly different. And I challenge you to listen to the rest of the presentation to try and identify why this is. Also, why do we have four spikes and not two if we're only interested in two frequencies? As we know, the Fourier transform is a linear operation. And linear operations performed in one domain, such as the time domain, have corresponding operations in the other or frequency domain. Consequently, we have an inverse discrete Fourier transform, which is simply the operation of reconstructing all the sinusoids from the Fourier transform and summing them together to obtain the observed signal. Some of the signal processing operations needed in the observation and reconstruction of astronomy signal are easier in one domain than the other. An example of this is convolution, which we will learn later, is computationally much more time consuming or expensive in the time domain but corresponds to an ordinary multiplication in the frequency domain, and therefore easier in that domain. From the equations of the DFT and the IDFT, we note clear symmetries between forward and inverse transforms. In general, both the frequency and time domain signals may be complex value, and multiplication of these complex values yields certain other symmetries between time and frequency domain signals. These symmetries we have summarized in a table shown in the lower right-hand corner. Other important forms of symmetry to note is that functions that are localized or narrow in the time domain will have Fourier transforms that are spread out or wide across the frequency domain, and also vice versa. You can investigate these transforms at your own pace by running the basic transform notebook available in the cookbook repository along with other example notebooks used in this presentation. Here it will be worthwhile to note that although all the functions we will show you in the example notebooks are real values, real value time series can still be considered as complex with only the imaginary component being set to zero. So lastly on our theoretical side, let's add some useful Fourier theorems to remember. We'll start off with the addition theorem. Since the Fourier transform is a linear transform, the transform of the sum of two functions is equal to the sum of the transforms of the individual functions. Although this in itself is not remarkable, it does allow for a certain amount of manipulation and simplification. Then this, in the shifting theorem, if a time domain function is shifted in time, the amplitude of the, the frequency components will remain the same, but the phase of the compo a component will be shifted. And you will see this in action during your calibration. And then the similarity theorem. As the time domain function expands in time, the frequency domain function compresses in spectrum, but it also increases in amplitude. And alternatively, if you compress the spectrum of the function, its time domain will expand and its amplitude will decrease. Then the modulation theorem. Now we know that the Fourier transform produces frequency components at both positive and negative frequencies symmetrically around DC, remember? And each of these components will have an amplitude that's half the amplitude of the originating function. Multiplying a function with a sinusoid will produce two sideband frequencies, therefore, centered around the carrier frequency of the sinusoid. And this allows the frequency of signals to be changed easily using mixing and signals to move sine waves to appropriate frequencies. And then also the derivative theorem, which simply states the derivative of a function becomes a simple multiplication of the spectrum in the time domain. So moving on to combining the individual signals. The convolution of two functions produce a third function that typically represents a modified version of one of the input functions. This modified output of convolution represents the area overlap between the two input functions as a function of the amount that one of the input functions is shifted with respect to the others, and that is shown in the illustration. 
From the convolution equation, we see that to calculate the convolution of two n-sample signals, x and h, we need to compute the convolution sum of each value of n separa uh, separately over all values of m with the kernel h, time reversed. This way of calculating the convolution is clearly computationally expensive, but we will simplify that by looking at the convolution theorem. When the convolution theorem states that the Fourier transform of convolution of two functions is simply the product of their individual Fourier transforms, which means that convolution in the frequency domain is much simpler, just a multiplication function, and faster and easier. Cross-correlation is very similar to convolution, except that the kernel is not time-reversed during the calculation. Cross-correlation is a very efficient way to compare signals and functions to find and search for similarities. Similarly to convolution, the cross-correlation theorem states that the Fourier transform of the correlation of two functions is equal to the product of the individual Fourier transforms when one of the transforms has been complex conjugate, which also makes cross-correlation much easier to compute in the Fourier domain than the time domain, and this is also what is driving the bigger correlator design in the bigger interferometer telescopes. So now that we have highlighted those sections of the theory, of Fourier theory that's important to radio astronomy, Let's work through a few examples that's a little more representative of the radio astronomy observations and signals. For those interested, you can work your way through the sampling theorem notebook to see how telescope engineers use the FFT to sample the observed signal. Here you will learn about the concepts of Nyquist frequency and its reciprocal, the Nyquist rate, which is the rate at which a signal should be sampled to avoid aliasing. But for the purposes of this presentation, let's move on to visualizing some aspects of signals and spectra using Fourier transforms. First off, radio astronomy dish apertures are flat surfaces. So the pattern they observe are two-dimensional Fourier transform samples. The 2D transform notebook illustrates how fringe phases gives directional information as well as how the convolution of the antenna beam with the observed signal result in the well-known artifacts that you will see in your dirty images. So let's, let's work our way through the notebook to visualize the concept of radio astronomy interferometry. So in real life, the antenna aperture is 2D, so we'll have a 2D Fourier transform to consider. Let's start by looking at the simple square. We'll just construct, uh, construct a simple square, 100 by 100 pixels, and we'll put a small little dot in the center. And on this 2D surface, we will now apply the FFT. On the right hand, we see the time domain or original signal, sorry, on the left hand, and on the right hand, we see the Fourier component but there's nothing there. Well, not technically true. There's everything there, except not as we expected. In time domain, information is shared as distance and perspective. In frequency domain, it is more structural and phased, which means that for point source, all the information is distributed equally across the entire image or 2D space. And if we look at the, at the output, the 2D Fourier transform, we indeed see that what we see is a flat spectrum of only ones. So what happens if we have two point sources and now we start adding structure? So we add a second spot. And what we can see is now we start to see the so-called interference fringes that we so often hear. Something to note, is the information that the fringes give me because the, fr the direction of the fringes is actually perpendicular to the direction of the two individual dots. And if I swap direction, you can see so did the fringe directions. So that gives me some in information on direction. Now moving on 
two, well, here we had two cosines, two positives. How about a negative and a positive, a real and imaginary, sine and cosine? So we see the direction of the fringes are still the same. But what is not so easy to see is that we have a slight phase shift. And for that, we're going to zoom in a little bit on the fringes themselves. For the two cosines, the two positives, we see that the center, phi center, is exactly on the fringe. But when I introduce the imaginary component, we see we now get a pi over 2 shift in the phase center. And lastly, our convolution. So as we said, we have a flat circular aperture for an antenna dish. When we take the FFT that we measure with a radio telescope, it's actually nothing more than the diffraction, uh, diffraction pattern. So if I take that diffraction pattern and I use apply that to my two sources during observation, I get a mixture. I get both the interference patterns of my sources as well as the diffraction pattern of my antenna. And that is the convolution I'm going to measure. And you will see that when you do your imaging. Secondly, astronomy signals are weak and borrowed in the system noise of the antenna receiver itself. This makes radio astronomy a science challenge to find the faintest signal lost in noise. The FDN noise notebook shows the power of the Fourier transform to lift a weak signal above a noisy background. So now the FFT and noise. Now we know that our radio astronomy signals are buried in noise, but the Fourier transform help us to find these because we can focus in on specific frequencies. So let's start off. Fourier transform of noise, okay? We generate noise by simply incoherently adding a bunch of sinusoids. The amplitudes and the, phase of, and, and the phases don't match. And therefore, we have a very flat time series and a very flat frequency spectrum. Okay, so for the FFT, that's just flat. But when we have a signal, something with a beat, something with a frequency, we see that when we take the FFT or for a Fourier transform of that time domain signal, we see the frequency pops up because the beat repeats. There's a consistent beat that is being amplified to some extent. And we exploit this. So noise, FFT of noise, flat. Noise with a signal. Doesn't look much different from just flat noise. But if I apply the Fourier transform, you can see the signal becoming visible. Although there are bigger noise floor, the signal is still visible. And the longer we observe this beat, the better our detection of the signal. In summary, during this presentation, we introduced how the Fourier and inverse Fourier transforms form an integral part of radio astronomy, how radio astronomy telescopes measure Fourier components, and that the Fourier transform as various theorems and symmetries we exploited to observe and process the signals. We saw that Fourier analysis gives us information about a signal by approximating the signal with a series of periodic signals, and that we can observe intricate astronomy structures by combining signals through correlation. We can do all this even if our signal is hidden in the system noise, since the continual good fit of that frequency will cause the observed frequency to become visible above the noise and allow us to detect it. And lastly, for those interested in the mathematical details of Fourier analysis and its application in radio astronomy, some links at the bottom to get you started. Thank you.